Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijspers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, we will be looking at an article called The Search for the Source of Epistemic Good, written by Linda Zagzabski. Now, this article is about something that is known in epistemology, in the, in the part of philosophy that deals with knowledge, as the value problem. So we should first understand the value problem before we can start to understand what Zagzabski is going to do with it. Essentially, the value problem is this. Why do we care about knowledge? Right? What is so valuable about knowledge that we strive for it and that philosophers have put it front and center in much of their thinking uh, for millennia? And it may seem at first sight that this value problem is extremely easy to solve, right? Uh, it's extremely easy to solve because knowledge is valuable in a practical way. If I want to get to the train station and I know where the train station is, I'll probably get there. Uh, if I want to get to the train station and I don't know where the train station is, I won't get there. And so it seems that the value of knowledge is you know, it's, it's very easy to explain. We just need it in practice for all kinds of things. Now, what philosophers have pointed out, in fact, Plato already pointed this out, but it's become a very popular topic again in, in contemporary epistemology, is that for getting to the train station, you don't actually need knowledge. You need something that seems to be quite a bit less demanding than knowledge. All you need to get to the train station, somebody might say, is a true belief about where the train station is. If I believe that the train station is in the center of town, and if that's true, if my belief is true, then I'll set out for the center of town and I'll arrive at the train station. So a true belief seems to be in practice all that I need to attain my ends. But, philosophers would go on to say, Knowledge is not just true belief. And here's one way to see that, right? Suppose that I believe that the train station is in the center of town merely because I had a hunch, I guessed it. I thought, oh, where could the train station be? Uh, oh, well, maybe the center of town. Yeah, sure, the center of town. That's where it must be. If that's my, my thought process, right? If I just guessed it and then convinced myself and that's why I believe it, and it happens to be true, right? I happen to be right, then I have a true belief, but I clearly don't have knowledge, right? Nobody would say that I know where the train station is. I just happily guessed correctly where the train station is. Knowledge demands something more. Maybe it demands that I arrived at my belief through some reliable process or through good reasons, something like that, right? I, if I had looked up where the train station is, on Google Maps, or if I had asked my neighbor who often goes to the train station, you know, those would have been, been methods maybe of arriving at a true belief that would have been good enough to, to make it real knowledge, to make it count as knowledge. Okay, so why do we care about those methods? That's the, the value problem then, right? Um, it's easy to see why we care about having true beliefs, but why do we care about having not just true beliefs, but knowledge? Why is it important for us that we don't just guess correctly? Why is it important for us and why have philosophers put so much emphasis on this idea that we really want to know things? All right, now we get to Linda Zagzabski's article. The first thing that she does is she points out that there is a whole class of theories of knowledge that have real trouble solving this value problem. And her main example is reliabilism. So reliabilism is the claim, and I already alluded to it a couple of moments ago, reliabilism is the claim that to know is to have a true belief that was formed on the basis of a reliable process. And a reliable process is just some process that often leads to true beliefs. So for instance, if I you know, arrived at, at my belief about the location of the train station by looking it up on Google Maps. And if looking things up on Google Maps is usually, you know, going to lead to correct ideas about where things are, 
probably is. I mean, there's no doubt mistakes, things change and so on and so forth, but usually it leads to the right answer. So it's reliable. Then that is knowledge. And what Zygzabski points out using the analogy with an espresso machine is that on this kind of theory, it is really hard to see why we care that something is knowledge rather than true belief. Here's the analogy. Suppose you have two espresso machines, right? So these are machines that make espresso coffee. One of them is very reliable. Every time you push the espresso button, it makes a cup of really great espresso coffee. The other one is not so reliable. When you press the button, you get a cup of really good espresso coffee, but only 20% of the time and 80% of the time, it just gives you hot water. Okay. It's easy to see why we care about reliability of the machine, right? Everybody would prefer having the reliable machine to the unreliable machine, at least if you like espresso. But the fact that one machine is reliable and the other is unreliable doesn't seem to be relevant to how good the espresso is that they make, right? You wouldn't object to getting a cup of espresso from the unreliable machine on the basis that the machine was unreliable because in this case it made espresso. So that's fine. That's all you care about. So the reliability or unreliability of the machine doesn't make the espresso any better or worse. In the same way, Sakszewski suggests, the reliability or unreliability of some process of arriving at a true belief doesn't seem to make the true belief as such more valuable or less valuable. All we care about is that it's a true belief. And I think that's a pretty, pretty strong, um, a pretty strong argument. Right? If, we, if we look at these processes, then we can certainly see why certain machines or certain processes would be more desirable to engage in because they're more reliable. But when we look at the end product, it is extremely unclear why the reliability or you know, other desirable characteristic of the process has anything to do with the desirability of the end product. So, if I buy something in the shop, I care about its properties. I don't really care about, you know, the way that, that the, um, that it was made. If that doesn't have any, any further, um, relevance for its current properties. I mean, if the machines in the, in the factory break down all the time and the workers are lazy and whatever, but this time they made a good product. Well, that's fine with me, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's unclear why the process would have any relevance for the value of the product. And so Zagzabski draws the conclusion here already quite, uh, quite soon in the article that we need to think about knowledge on a different model. We need to think about knowledge on the model of acts of an agent, because when we think about acts of an agent, it suddenly becomes not just possible, but very plausible that properties of the agent are relevant for the value of the act. Here's an example, um, an example from, from morals, right? Suppose that I, um, give to a, a person who really needs that money, uh, in order to buy food for their starving children. I give them 20 euros. Is that a good act or not? Well, it certainly depends, right? If I gave them those 20 euros, if I intended to give them those 20 euros, I, I wanted to give it to them. Um, and I wanted to give it to them so that they could feed their poor, hungry children. Well, this would seem to be a morally good act, right? If I intentionally gave those 20 euros to them, but I only did it because, um, I don't know, I was uh, there with my boss and I want to impress my boss with my morally good behavior so that my boss is going to give me a raise. And so my intention is to get rich. 
and I really couldn't care less about this poor person and their hungry children, then it's not so clear that this is a morally good action, right? I mean, it might still be good in some sense that this person now has 20 euros with which they can buy food, um, but it's not so clear that I have engaged in a morally good act. In fact, we might say that it's in some sense even a despicable act, right? I'm just using this person in order to get my raise. I mean, that's, that's very dubious. So when we think about things on the model of agents and acts, then suddenly it seems very plausible that the reasons behind, the processes behind the act are relevant for the value of the act itself. And so Zaksapsky's suggestion is that this is the kind of model that we need to use to think about knowledge too. We need to think about knowledge as an act of the epistemic subject. And if we do that, then the way that the epistemic subject arrives at their beliefs and maybe the motives or motivations behind the arriving at those beliefs can very plausibly be relevant for the value of the state they end up in. And so we might uh, suggest something, and this is something that, that Zaksepsky in fact suggests, we might suggest something like this. Perhaps what makes knowledge more valuable than merely true belief is that knowledge is a state we end up in by definition when we, or well, maybe not by definition, but knowledge is a state we end up in when we are pursuing the truth because we love the truth, right? And it's not by definition because we might end up with wrong conclusions that are not knowledge, but um, maybe knowledge requires that it is the result of the pursuit of true belief for the sake of truth. If something like that is right, so we are talking about my motives, about why I am doing certain things, and I'm not doing certain things because, you know, it just um, popped into my mind or because I think it will be advantageous to me. But I do it. I, I, I perform these mental acts, so to speak, um, these acts of knowledge out of a love for truth. Well, maybe that in some sense makes them admirable, right? Then people will say, wow, that's it's so great that that's the way that you approach things, that the way that you reason. Okay, maybe people don't think it's great because we all do this all the time, but there's something admirable about the serious pursuit of truth, that a pursuit of, of, mere, um, of mere true belief, I mean, I don't even know how you would do that, but that you know, arriving at merely true beliefs might not, um, might not involve. So what is important, according to Sengzavsky, is this idea that um, beliefs are in some sense acts, they have motives, and those motives might involve virtues, virtues like a love for truth. And maybe there are other virtues too, um, but all of them, as exactly suggests, probably have something to do with an underlying love for truth, right? You might want to be fair, you might want to be thorough, um, you might want to uh, look up the, the, the correct experts and, and give them an appropriate amount of authority and so on and so forth. All of that would seem to be sort of specific ways of pursuing this love for truth. So, if love of truth is a good motive, Zygzamski writes, it would add value to the intellectual acts that it motivates. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go to section two of the paper, where Zagzavsky takes this story that she's, that, that she's just been telling and raises a problem for it. And the problem is this. Quite often, it would seem to be the case that knowledge isn't very valuable. Right? I mean, we asked about the value of knowledge and we um, wanted to explain the value of knowledge. And now we've even given a sort of story of what knowledge is in terms of virtue and a certain kind of value, right? Knowledge is, you know, what we when we arrive at true belief through 
our serious pursuit of the love of truth. Something like that is the story we want to tell about knowledge. Um, but a lot of knowledge doesn't seem to be very valuable at all. Some knowledge seems to be so trivial that it would be really hard to think of it as valuable. And it would be really hard to think of somebody who has seriously pursued it as admirable. So, for instance, Zagzabski's own example is, you know, if you have seriously pursued knowledge of the number of times the word the was used in a particular McDonald's commercial. Yeah, you know, that, that doesn't seem to be very valuable. And if somebody says, you know what I've done with my life? I've counted the word the in every McDonald's commercial. Like, oh, that, that doesn't sound very admirable. In fact, in certain cases, uh, we would even think that pursuing some kind of knowledge uh, is even like bad, right? It might be bad for me maybe to know certain things, but it might also be bad for other people if I know certain things. So if I um, have an intimate knowledge of everything that happens in my neighbor's house, my neighbors might not be very happy with that. And we wouldn't think it very admirable if I pursued for the love of truth, this intimate knowledge of everything that happens in my neighbor's house. And in fact, um, I think my, my, my claim to do this out of a love of truth probably wouldn't hold up in a lot of circumstances. I mean, if I, if I have to appear in court and the judge asks me, well, why did you install all these cameras in every room of your neighbor's house and I said it's the love of truth your honor my pursuit of the love of truth uh, I mean that that wouldn't make any sense right I, well at least at least it wouldn't hold up at least we would think that there's something wrong with me that I'm not admirable that there's something perverse about me in uh, in one way or another so um so how how what are we to do with this Right? How are we to understand the value of knowledge if knowledge as such doesn't seem to be good? I mean, there seem to be trivial elements of knowledge. There seem even to be maybe sort of negative knowledge, like knowledge where the value of having it is negative. Uh, so how are we to think about this? And Zagzabski's strategy in the article is to argue that pursuing truth and valuing truth is a sort of motive that falls out of, that is derived from higher up motives, the most fundamental of which are basically just the motive to lead the good life, to lead the morally good life, um, but also to lead maybe uh, the good life in a, in a somewhat broader sense, right? To lead the happy life. It's because I want to be morally good that I need to have all kinds of knowledge because if I don't know enough about the world and I don't know enough about the people in the world, then, you know, if I do something that is, that is, you know, helpful maybe to people, it's, it's just by chance or just by accident, right? If I, if I desire to be morally good, I should also desire to know the truth about all kinds of things. Um, and there could, in fact, come to think of it, thinking back of my, my own example, there could be circumstances where it's important for me to get intimate knowledge of what happens in my neighbor's house if I think there are serious moral motives for that, right? If I think that, you know, there somebody might be a victim of abuse or, or something like that, maybe still shouldn't install cameras. I mean, don't, I, I'm not here on YouTube telling you to install cameras in your neighbor's house. Don't do it. Um, but morality could be one reason for pursuing truth. And in fact, the good life in general could give us reasons to pursue truth because truth is so often um, relevant for what we want to do. And so we sort of come back to the original point about the value of knowledge being some kind of, you know, some kind of practicality. But where the original proposal that I gave in the beginning was that it's good to know acts because knowing acts might help you in some practical purpose. And there we could object that actually just having a true belief about acts is enough to have, give you, you know, that, that practical purpose. The story we're now telling is this. The story we're now telling is that it's our desire to live a good life 
that gives us a motive for pursuing the truth. And when we arrive at true beliefs, because we have seriously pursued the truth, you know, that's when we, when we talk about knowledge. That's when we are beyond the stage of mere true belief. And so here we, we have a story where some kind of practical concern in the broadest sense of the word, like our concern to live a good life, leads us to have certain motives, including the motive of pursuing the truth. And acting on those motives is actually what, you know, what it is to be intellectually virtuous and to arrive at states, intellectual states that are admirable and that we might give the exalted name of knowledge. And so Zygzabski's final, um, final suggestion in the article is that the epistemic good cannot be seen as distinct from the good in general the good of the good life, the moral good, um, maybe, who knows, things like the aesthetic good and so on uh, as well. But in order to understand the good of knowledge, we really need an account of the good life and why the good life is desirable and why the good life is admirable and why we should desire to be admirable, why we should desire not just to you know, have happiness thrown upon us, but why we should also desire to act in ways that are morally admirable, but also epistemically admirable. And so we need a very um, fundamental story about the goodness of the good life in order to really understand the value of knowledge. And that's not a story that Zygzabski is giving us, but what she has done is she has argued quite strongly that epistemology and knowledge are not some sort of you know, thing on their own that have nothing to do with ethics and the good life, um, but in fact that these things might be very strongly connected. Thank you.